Welcome to the One Life Maps podcast. Here's your host and co-author of Listen to My Life, maps for recognizing and responding to God in my story, Sharon Swing. Greetings, this is Sharon Swing. Thanks so much for tuning in to the One Life Maps podcast once again. I am Sharon Swing along with Sybil Towner here today. And uh, I'm just glad to be here with you, Sybil. And I am glad to be here too. I really like doing these. Yes. These, good, these are good conversations. Today, we're going to take a quote out of a book called Let Your Life Speak, Listening for the Voice of Vocation by Parker Palmer. And we looked at the beginning of this book, and we realized that it was only published in the year 2000. That just yeah. seems like it should have been. It seems like it's a lot older book than that. In fact, the copy I have in my hand, the pages are yellowed. I've got writing all over the margins and lots of um, things that I have underlined through it all. And this book really spoke to me um, when I read it and had some of the things it was expressing a lot of the things that Sybil and I actually converged over. Yes. Uh, I mean, the circumstances of life, uh, the place where we were in being formed in the image of Christ, the questions we were asking. And uh, Parker seemed to just say, oh my gosh, keep going. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a really deep connection. There was a, he had words to describe some, some things that were stirring in us already. And yeah, I, I would say that, that Parker's words were instrumental in us um, coming even up with the idea of listen to my life, maps yeah. for recognizing and responding to God, my story, and helping people to sort out their life stories, sort out um, who God made them to be and what kind of adventure he might have for them in the world. Yes. And um, I know for me, I had come out of completing my master's degree a few years prior to that um, in organization development. And I was a part of this incredible program at Pepperdine. Um, it was an executive format program, and so much of it was deep listening it was listening to ourselves and understanding ourselves well enough that we could facilitate groups and lead groups in a way that we were in just so that we would be so self-aware in the midst of it that we could put our own agendas aside for the benefit of the groups we were helping. So, um, for example, if we like to avoid conflict, then maybe we would steer a group around conflict that actually needs to happen because it needs to be resolved, you know, things like yeah. that. And be able to really help people listen to one another in groups where decisions are being made that really, really matter. And sometimes you're talking about helping people, just creating a space so that people can express themselves. And sometimes they don't even know why they feel so strongly about one thing or another. Yeah. And, and actually, you're speaking about that. The, the organization that Parker started, uh, one of them was um, Circles of Trust. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he is an educator. And so his first group were educators um, in the uh, elementary, public, high school system, and then college systems and really gathering people together to practice how to give each other space to be who we were in that moment. And uh, he wrote a book, Courage to Teach, and said we teach from the inside out, whether we know it or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I went to one of those circles of trust, and our grandson is also a teacher, and we sent him to one to just... Um, uh, help him as a young in his 20s uh, to say this this aspect of teaching is so important mm -hmm. for the students whatever age they are that you come to know who you are because known or unknown that is what you're teaching out of it, it shows up in the midst of yes. what you're doing and so we had those things in common even though we hadn't spoken them out yes and um, at the time, Sybil was a volunteer, full-time volunteer, pretty much, doing as, as director of spiritual mentoring 
in the church we were a part of. And um, they were, as a piece of that, helping people to document just a short piece of their story well actually to document their story it was it was a longer piece but but how that unfolded was really out of the what you talked about at Pepperdine was out of listening because the person um, Andrea Minor who was happened to be head of the women's ministry at that time came to me and said Sybil you have listened to me for seven years would you create something that will help people listen to one another in that way. Mm -hmm. And that was the, that was the uh, birth of the spiritual mentoring. And, um, uh, and then with Susan Shadid, uh, we developed that particular course and developing spiritual mentors actually um, at Willow. Right. And so in the spiritual life, Sybil, why is it important to give people space to be listened to? Well, there's a line that we have um, uh, quoted in our materials is listening is so close to being loved that most people can't tell the difference. Um, an African saying is someone saying to you, I see you, and the other person says, I see you back. I'm wondering if... That isn't, I don't know how that phrase is actually used in the African culture, but when it comes and is verbalized in our culture, it it startles us a bit because we realize that we walk past people. We say, how are you? And we're actually already walking past them, not wanting to hear them. And, and they say, fine. And how are you? And you're back to back and you've said fine to each other. But the longing that we have is to be seen, to be known, to be heard. It is as deep as really the creation of the earth. I, I think that a lot of what this book, um, Let Your Life Speak, that Parker Palmer wrote, uh, has so much to do with listening to yourself, but we don't know how to listen to ourselves without having somebody speak to yeah. and to create that space for us where we can speak freely. Um, and I think so much of the times when I have been truly listened to how much I have learned about myself in the midst of it. Yeah. Well, we, we live in a uh, Western Christian culture that is very individual, and we've made God an individual. Even though we verbalize there is a trinity, we really don't get that. And there's a community that created the world. There's a community in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is deferring and listening to one another, and that is what we were created out of it. We have a longing for it. And uh, and our fear comes that keeps us from moving is that somehow we will not be heard. We will not be understood. And the pain of that keeps us or draws us into isolation. Yeah, I know that for me, um, experiences and how I process things, the idea of feeling like I'm being overlooked or underestimated um, mm. really has something deep in my soul that I have to watch myself with um, because I will tell myself a story that has something to do with those things. Um, I'll interpret circumstances through those lenses. And until I've, I actually speak it out and I and listen to myself, I have to be able to sort out what of this is, is my own issue and what is actually really happening here and give myself yeah. some perspective. But I know the stories I tell myself well enough to question myself yeah. on them. Yeah. And there's, there's these, these spaces where mentors and spiritual directors and counselors and, and really coaches. good, good friends, coaches, yeah, create these spaces where there might be an opportunity to be able to really hear ourselves. And, and when we talk about ourselves, it's not this navel gazing, self absorbed kind of thing. The assumption behind that, how we talk about it, is that God created each one of us yeah. 
And he created us with unique wirings, unique abilities and gifts and desires, and also in a particular place and time and setting. And there's something that God wants to do through us as he made us to be for the benefit of others. Yes. These, these are assumptions that we share. And, and it's so interesting. Dan Allender um, uh, says um, uh, our faces are the most naked part of ourselves. We need each other to see each other's faces. Mm -hmm. And so um, to be able to look at someone and say, your eyes look tired. Or as uh, God said to Cain, why are you so downcast? Um, And it exposed actually what was going on in him, and the eyes are the window of the soul. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people come to listen to my life. They might be asking themselves a question of um, how the word Parker would use would be vocation. Yes. And he talks about there's a Latin root for the word um, at at the root of, of vocation, Latin for voice. And vocation does not mean a goal that I pursue. It means a calling that I hear. Before I can tell myself, my before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I must listen to my life telling me who I am. Yeah, that's... Uh, okay, before I so, ask you to respond to that, <laughs> I'm going to read another piece of okay. this. Um, he says, vocation does not come from willfulness. It comes from listening. I must listen to my life and try to understand what it is truly about, quite apart from what I would like it to be about, or my life will never represent anything real in the world, no matter how earnest my intention. There is so much in those two statements. Yes. I'm going to hand that book back to you here. So I think the word willfulness we usually think of that with somebody about two years old. We we tend to talk about children. We don't tend to talk about adults as willful. We use some other words um, for uh, an adult in that regard. But willfulness, if I were, I don't know what Parker fully means, but if I were to say it, is we try so hard to be conformed. It's an outside in way of being. And we do that because we want to be seen. We want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We want to have a place. And it is a beginning of a journey. But when we are exerting the all of the energy to make that happen, we close down the listening or the gift of what is in us that really comes forward by listening. I think by willfulness, as, as he's talking about it, vocation does not come from willfulness is the, is the phrase we're referring to here. Willfulness, I think, has to, I'm going to make this happen. Yes. And it has a, um, the, the, what's not answered that's lingering in the background because I want the things you're talking about. I want prestige or I need yeah. to satisfy my ego. Or it could be I need to satisfy my parents' desire for me to become whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. in some cultures that would be a a doctor or it would be <laughs> you know yeah, well you know that willfulness I, I did I what popped into my head I just thought of Greg Laganus, who was a diver. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for his father's love, and he felt his willfulness was, how high can I dive to get his love? And so he put himself at risk, actually, but, but, um, but that thing, that desire, which at some point he was able to name, he was trying to get a that a boy or I approval from his dad. So we, we go chasing after all kinds of things yeah. that once we get them will not be satisfying. Yes. Um, we all have our ways of doing it. And it's almost like we have to live enough life to recognize that that's what we're doing and it's not going to pay off before we really can sit down and be quiet enough to, as 
Parker calls it, listen yes. to our lives. and Because it's already there. Mm -hmm. It's already in us. We, we don't have to find something out there. Yeah. No diploma is going to satisfy the longing of our hearts no. or no promotion no. or whatever else. So it, it's like beginning to take the trail of noticing what did we do in the moments when someone wasn't looking. It could have been with people. What did we do that required energy but seemed effortless? Mm -hmm. um, what did we do whether we got a paycheck or not? Mm -hmm. um, what did we do that was attended by love, by joy, by peace, by patience, um, by just being faithful to who we are, um, by a peacefulness, a peaceableness in us. I mean, it was just good. And honestly, it could have been any number of things. It could have been, uh, as a kid, the way we played a game, um, the way we involved others, the way we played an instrument, going off into our room and writing, um, exploring the out of doors. Mary Oliver. Okay, Mary Oliver was an observant student of creation. She went through a woods to go to school, and she often got lost in the woods and didn't show up at school. And she could sit for hours and watch a spider building his web. Hours. And if you read her poetry, it flows out. It is who she was, and she never quite fit into the system of education that was a part of her life. So the quiet, patient observance would then outflow into poetry that we can, that I think anybody can enjoy. Yes. It's not esoteric no. in a way that, that seems unattainable or what she's saying. She's pretty darn clear about yeah. what she's up to with, with, with her words. And, um, this, and this... she saw, she listened to creation. Mm -hmm. So looping back, just back into this idea of vocation, a lot of people think vocation in terms of, um, like you said, how we're going to earn a, poach, a paycheck. But this kind of vocation is what is our life designed to express. Yes. Another important thing that you said in the midst of there, it's already there because we didn't design ourselves. No. Um, the story begins outside of us um, as God has intentions for us. And then we're born into a story that's already in progress. Yes. And, uh, and same children, even twins, identical twins can be born into the same family and look at it very, very differently and end up with different vocation, different uh, expressions yes. in the world. Um, and what are we adding to the world's beauty that's in yes. play? Yeah, there's a, uh, and that is, that that's a great question to ask. I mean, that, that begins to stir, uh, stir that um, is the word beauty. And uh, there's a book by, uh, it's called Miss Rumphius, and mm -hmm. there were three questions um, or three things that her uh, uncle or grandfather said to her. But his the last question was, how will you make the world a more beautiful place? Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that means my existence counted. Sometimes, and that's just, uh, that's such a practical statement to me, as well as something of intrinsic beauty. So it could be anybody. It could be a gardener. It could be somebody who visits um, people. It could, be, um, it could be a shopkeeper. It could be a teacher. I mean, there isn't 
anything it couldn't be. And it almost doesn't matter what you're doing as, as much as how you're doing it. No. And so today, this part of the sad thing for me is what has happened to higher education is a higher education has been counted successful by the jobs that their graduates get that have high pay scales. And the whole goal of many colleges now is not a um, liberal arts education, how to think critically, how to explore philosophy, how to... um, how to expand um, your way of thinking. It's about, it's actually, they've become vocational schools, Mm -hmm. which means schools has the same word, vocation, but it's what kind of job am I going to get? And that is not a good end goal. It is something we need, but it is not the essence. When practicality trumps everything else, um, we end up being a bit impoverished in the soul. Yes. <laughs> and uh, because it's the things that nurture the soul are seemingly frivolous to the outside world. You know, quietness, taking a walk in nature, um, reading poetry, um, even the way we become quiet before God in a way that, and cause a lot of the things that, that I mentioned before, are doorways into noticing if God is is speaking to us. Yes. Sitting with someone who is not well, sitting with someone who is older, who really can't tell you um, much except to repeat a story after story. And when they tell you the story, they've forgotten they've told it, and they tell it to you again. Mm -hmm. And sitting patiently and kindly, holding a hand and looking in their eyes and say, Tell it to me again. Mm-hmm. So this this quote, once again, vocation does not come from willfulness. It comes from listening. I must listen to my life and try to understand what it is truly about, quite apart from what I would like it to be about, or my life will never represent anything real in the world, no ho- matter how earnest my intentions the, the piece that stands out to me, you know, this, of course, listen to my life. That's, that's the, uh, the phrase that <laughs> resonated with us to the point of, of naming the listen Our to resource. my life materials. And, but the, the subtitle being recognizing and responding to God in my story. So listen to my life, maps for recognizing and responding to God in my story. Because if God's the author... And then we've got this, so listen to my life. You mentioned all different kinds of things about about how we might listen to our lives in terms of what we might notice about how we process things. It might be different than other people and, and all. But then there's this aspect of, then what does it mean? One, are there any other means by which we listen to our yes. lives? Tell me more about that. Well, one is if I'm invited to listen to my life, it means that there is someone who has something to say to me about my life. So it does mean, uh, it does mean some form of attentiveness, of awareness, um, of quiet, and of really noticing. And that's why not by words, but by pictures, we ask people to document their stories so that I might put a date, I might draw a picture, I might put a school building, might make stick figures of people, so that each time I come to that story again, I'm listening in a new way for what it might want to tell me. And... um, and so I realize uh, that it's when I realize something is already there, one, I stop grasping. I actually find myself settled. And I'm not finding myself in the future, I'm not finding myself in the past but I'm finding myself having come present. 
and it um, and it is actually the only moment in which I have any power. And so, um, that's I think what God waits for. Yeah, I like to say to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but just to get a straightforward word first to tell us his stories Mm -hmm. and stories we may have heard and and to bring forward a story in us that we don't know why that story has come back forward, but he is in it. And if we pay attention and travel that road, he will show us. Yeah, I, we also, in the following forward map, the eighth map, on um, the last map in the Listen to My Life series, um, there's a piece of that that has a what will I take with me and what will I leave behind. And we do that same kind of exercise a lot of times at the end of our workshops, this take with, leave behind. And, and you can talk about that in terms of what did this workshop do in, mm-hmm. in terms of, of uh, um helping me to sort out some things. Uh, but in a larger sense, this take with leave behind, is it, is it in the context of listening to my life story? I can tell you stories about the picture of God that was handed to me and how I lived in that part of the story and then how my picture of God shifted because of various different events and wh- other ways the story has been told to me, that I have had to leave some stories about how God was um, more wrathful. I've had to leave behind some stories about um, God's distance from me and from how he kind of looks down on humanity kind of to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit living in us and through us you know, and how personal that is and how present that is. And somehow it was a history lesson and now it's in present. So there's this, this what, am I, what am I leaving behind that's no longer useful to me? Many times I, I came by those stories honestly. They were handed to me honestly by people who thought they had a picture that was accurate. And yet... I'm here saying, oh, I don't, I don't see it that way anymore. And what if I live into this way of seeing God? Because every experience, um, you know, in, in coaching, a lot of times we'll, we'll ask questions and people bring up a, like, you'll ask a question, well, when did you feel this way before? What's an early experience that you remember? And they'll tell you a story and you'll say, well, in that, if you, if you, if you put yourself back in that space of, of, from your childhood, um, what did you take from that experience of what you learned about yourself? What did you learn about who God is and how he operates? And what did you learn about how the world works? Yeah. And what out of that is still in play for you today that may or may not be an accurate picture? Yes. So you're really talking about process. Right. <clears throat> and, and so some of us... In, in if we're to listen to our lives, and part of listening to our lives is actually listening to the God who created us. And so is the God, are we listening to the God that we perceived when we were four years old or six years old or 12 years old? And so letting go of the God we have known, but you need to name, as you did, who that was, to embrace the God who is. Mm-hmm. And that is a lifelong journey mm-hmm. that I, I don't even know if on the other side there's an end to it. Um, so I hope <clears throat> there's not. Yeah. So, um, so I just um, uh, feel that aspect of letting go is, is so important um, because... When we don't let go, we carry baggage that we were not meant to carry, and it keeps trying to inform. 
the fresh that has come to us. And that is really a part of listening to, that is a part of listening to our story, that mm. someone gave us the best they knew, or sometimes they didn't give us the best. That, that is always a possibility. But then listening to what is the truest part. And I think a part of that is uh, is scripture. I think a large part is listening and walking the life of Jesus. Walk with him, talk with him, be, really become a disciple and then listen to your life in that context because that certainly is what happened to Peter. It's what happened to John. Their lives were changed. Yes. And I think if we can look at every circumstance that comes our way as an opportunity to learn something and to learn something new about ourselves and how we see the world and then question it and and all I think there is a piece of this for me that if I can keep myself in that space of okay even though I don't like the circumstances this circumstance for example um, I there is something there for me to uncover and maybe an invitation to put something down or take something new up but God has something to say to me in the midst of whatever is. If I'm taking a breath, he has something to say. And And and, even um, when that stops, he'll have something (laughs) to say, right? Right. But, but, you know, I'm speaking from, um, you know, from this uh, particular vantage point um, that finding God in all things— Again, we have lived in a culture in this country, in America, that has equated um, hearing God when everything is going well, and that God is absent when things are not going well. Mm-hmm. And so in that aspect of, of listening, it's realizing that even the difficulties— Even the circumstances we would not have chosen under any circumstance, that we can find God in it if we will pay attention, if we will listen, and we will grow up. And so that is a part of our calling in life, is really to find out why are we living in this time, in this place, to extend the reign of the kingdom of God, to make the world a more beautiful place. I I like to live in the call of Queen Esther. Could it be that I was born for such a time as this? Pay attention. Yes, and and what good might come from asking that question of, of for such a time as this, that thought you know, just what if God has me here for such a time as this? Yeah. What would I do if I believed that God might be up to something here? Yeah. Um, I'd become exploratory. Yes. And I, I think part of the gift of this whole way of thinking is it keeps us from getting too sure of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it kind of expels certainty Yeah. as, as a high value. So... Um, it really takes out the willfulness that I have to, that I have to know, I have to control, I have to move. Mm -hmm. And it opens us to mystery that we only know in part. But the truth is, we are fully known. Mm -hmm. And that is the part that can take us the next step forward wherever we are. Right. And I mean, I, I remember very distinctly when I came to the realization, I, I stood in the middle of the kitchen one day and I said, when did I get so darn comfortable with ambiguity? <laughs> and it was just one of those, I don't know, I don't care that I don't know for sure. And that was so incredibly freeing to me. Yeah. I grew up in a, in a, in a, religious denomination that valued certainty and knowledge very, very greatly. But 
it left imagination out. And if there's anything that's true about me is I have an imagination. And uh, there is something so central to how I experience God that is, is essential for me to let go of certainty. Well, <laughs> letting go of certainty is entering reality. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you may think you know what you are doing this afternoon. I'm not sure you actually know what you are doing. You may intend something else may come across your path. I, I have a feeling that you're foretelling something, <laughs> in fact, uh, <laughs> at this point in time, given uh, what has happened prior to us recording this today. So I tell you what, let's close the conversation here because we can pick it up. There are phrases out of this book um, by Parker, Parker Palmer called Let Your Life Speak that we could pick oh, dozens and dozens of phrases out of here and have conversations about them. I would uh, definitely suggest that you pick this book up. Um, Let Your Life Speak, Listening for the Voice of Vocation by Parker Palmer. Mm -hmm. And it is a gift. It is a small, thin book, an easy read in an evening, but it'll take you a lifetime to digest. Amen. <laughs> and uh, um, what a, an incredible gift um, Parker Palmer has been in many aspects of uh, of influencing uh, Christendom, but also um, in in my my field of study organization development. He's been very influential in that as well, and, and in the whole field of education. Yeah, and hopefully we'll get to interview him. He's got a new yeah. book out. Yeah. called The Listening Life. And I, I really am looking forward to uh, diving into that one further as well. So this has been a conversation with Sybil Towner, co-author along with me, Sharon Swing, of Listen to My Life, Maps for Recognizing and Responding to God in My Story. It is a way of mapping your life story for the purpose of spiritual growth and meaningful action and basically what it says, listening to your life. And uh, we'd love to invite you into that. If you want to find out more, go to that One Life Maps uh, dot com website and you'll see an opportunity to download the introduction booklet that will give you a fuller description um, kind of let you know what you're getting yourself into if you decide to to uh, purchase the the portfolio of eight visual maps that will help you map your life story and we hope you'll take advantage of that so thank you so much for joining us today on the one life maps podcast great to be with you all Many blessings, everyone. Bye. Have you thought, I don't know myself anymore? Have you wondered, is there something more? Are you at a crossroads in life and asking, which way will lead me toward expressing more of who I am made to be? Are you looking for a way to understand the restlessness you feel inside? Are you seeking a deeper spiritual life and desire to rediscover who you are through God's eyes? You're ready for the life mapping experience of Listen to My Life. Go to onelifemaps.com to purchase your portfolio of visual life maps. While you're there, check out our upcoming virtual coaching groups, live workshops, and options for you to facilitate the Listen to My Life experience with others. That's onelifemaps.com. O-N-E-L-I-F-E-M-A-P-S.com.